Vanessa, what is DNA for Africa? DNA for Africa, it's a brand, it's a movement. It's an idea that we need to create more awareness, forensic DNA awareness throughout Africa. DNA for Africa has been developed to provide action-based solutions to ensure that ultimately the victims and the survivors of gender-based violence and crime can be assisted through this incredible technology called DNA, whether it's through humanitarian DNA databases, whether it's through identification of perpetrators who continuously um, commit these crimes. So the necessity is to try and look specifically at what our issues are in Africa and to specifically look at solutions that can be provided by people who live within Africa, as opposed to always looking outside of Africa for, for ideas and, and technologies that may not work in our environments. Why did you create a podcast series? The honest answer is because I'm stuck in my, <laughs> I'm stuck in my room and I can't get to the people that I want to meet throughout Africa to engage with them and um, to create platforms that we would ordinarily, ordinarily have had um, had it not been for COVID. So it was sparked by a need to communicate with people through, um, through COVID. And initially I had the idea of webinars, which were once off events that required people to be available at that particular time. Then I realized that podcasts actually had a dual function. Firstly, you were able to engage on a number of occasions, even before you had the podcast, with key role players and stakeholders within the forensic DNA community. And secondly, you were able then to watch it on demand or put it onto various platforms where people could access this particular information. The most extraordinary consequence of this is actually I have been able to connect a number of people I've interviewed on the different platforms, I mean, on the different podcasts, who have now connected with each other. And this really has achieved much more than I would have hoped for had I been physically going to the different countries and trying to meet with the various people. So whether it's survivors of humanitarian um, crimes, or whether it's uh, researchers pr producing low-cost DNA uh, rape kits, they, they all have an interest in assisting and learning from each other and they all have similar problems. So it's been a, a beautiful um, way to connect so many different role players and so many people who want to make a difference within Africa. Have you learned anything else from the podcast? I have learned so much. I have learned that people from Africa are so innovative, they're so resilient and yet so positive and despite the most incredible challenges are still able to look positively towards finding solutions. I have learned about how important a low cost DNA rape kit for instance is in countries which have such a problem with funding. I've learned that collaboration with donor funding together with government is key in order to provide infrastructures to a number of these countries who, who cannot on their own develop a forensic DNA laboratory or fund DNA analysis. I have learned that we need to call back so many of these incredible people who have left Africa and developed skills to come back and assist in the fight against crime. Specifically, I, I agree that a lot of the, it, this is not a, a, a turnkey solution that you can just go into a, a Western environment and say, well, this will work irrespective because most of those administrations operate in, in, in a similar manner. In Africa, you just have such a variety of, of methodologies, administrations, whether it's cultural, whether it's religious, whether it's um, from a government perspective. But yet there's a common thread with regards to the way in which things work within Africa. And I love that. I love the fact that it is different yet the same and that you always have to think outside of the box in order to provide solutions that, that work in our own particular environment, which is essentially what DNA for Africa is all about. It's providing 
skills, resources, ideas, and working together to facilitate and to ensure that those are felt at grassroots levels. What would your message be to administrations considering policy changes to enable the use of DNA in DNA databases in their criminal justice systems? Don't lose touch with the people which are being affected by policies which are either not in place or need to be effective if they are in place. Continue to allow survivors' voices to lead the way in terms of what priorities are required in order to be affected. So this becomes important for, from, from an advocacy perspective. If survivors are brave enough, and it, it takes a lot of courage to come forward and put themselves out into the public and talk about their experiences, the very least we can do is respect those survivors and do something about the issues that they are telling you are happening. They are the ones that can really tell you what the issues are, not your cabinet ministers, not the people who are not affected directly by the crime. So advocacy becomes a very important aspect of a government's commitment to finding solutions that eradicate crime in their particular system. So that would be my, my suggestion, work together with civil society, listen to what, what they have to say. I thought the suggestion that you made recently on your DNA backlog podcast with Mabali Shongwe was a really interesting concept and a really great idea in terms of transparency. You talked about having a backlog dashboard whereby a victim could follow their case. Can you tell me a bit more about that? One thing that struck me through our experiences of COVID is that we all desired access to information. It was unknown and we needed our administration to tell us what's going on so that we could make decisions that would protect us and protect the people that we love. This access to information not only engenders confidence in the administration that something is being actively done to support and to protect us. And in the same way, the DNA backlog crisis, which is all over the media at the moment, and it's over 300,000 cases, which represents more than a million samples that need to be analyzed. The government has committed to a DNA turnaround plan, but they're not transparent about what they're doing about it. We don't hear back from them other than that they have this great plan. So we don't have confidence in a plan that we don't have access to. Can they not create a dashboard where daily they say, this is the number of cases we've received. Yes, the backlog is now 300 and X thousand cases. But today we have analyzed X number of cases. This number of profiles have been loaded onto the database. This number of hits have been found to be linked to known offenders. And these cases have gone through to the National Prosecuting Authority. It might not be initially what we want to see in terms of numbers, but if we can see that there's movement and the government are actually trying to do something about it, that provides us with confidence and security that they care about the issues at hand. They care about what the survivors are saying and that they, it, it, it gives us access to information that we are entitled to see. So our call to action is to provide more transparency, which creates accountability in order for us to see that the commitments that government have said they have made towards reducing the DNA backlog are in fact being done on a daily basis. And that's really not that difficult to achieve as we've already seen them do in the COVID scenario. Vanessa, I believe you're doing your PhD. That's quite an undertaking. How's that going? And what are you researching? It's been an interesting journey and certainly I hope to complete it by the end of this year. The, the work that I do always requires further knowledge and this aspect of my, my research looks into privacy issues um, around forensic DNA profiling and how we can always ensure that those uh, rights to privacy, dignity and equality are always maintained. So it, it becomes useful when talking to other administrations and when 
understanding there's always concern around privacy, that there, there really is so much protection. Um, in fact, legislation really does provide much more protection around your rights to privacy, specifically in forensic DNA profiling. Tell me about your latest campaign, My Voice for Justice, supporting survivors of gender-based violence. Well, we must remember that it's not only gender-based violence. I think we have um, a range of crimes in this country, and I think that gender-based violence also in and of itself comes in many different forms, some of which are not as um, apparent as others. And My Voice for Justice talks to those different types of crimes that occur in South Africa and enables survivors to speak their truth as to how they have been affected by crime in South Africa. My Voice for Justice is really shifting the narrative from the administration whose voices have largely become ineffective and mistrusted to listening to survivors of violence speak their truth, which is authentic and harrowing and allowing people to determine what we can do about what they're telling us. So they are highlighting the issues that they have through their own experiences, realized need to be changed, whether it's sensitivity training, whether it's to ensure that the delays in the DNA testing should be reduced in order for their cases to actually get to court and not get kicked out because they have taken so long or they're just not being analyzed or worse still forensic DNA kits are just being thrown away by rape crisis centers because they don't have storage space for them because they don't have any faith in the system that they'll be analyzed. So the combination of justices in our DNA which talks very much to the power and effectiveness of forensic DNA and identifying and deterring perpetrators of crime to allowing survivors of crime to speak their truth and to how they can change the system through identifying which aspects have failed them. Vanessa, are there any new technologies which could be adapted in Africa? Absolutely. Currently, we're looking at trying to develop a pilot of um, a rapid DNA project this will entail using the rapid DNA technology, which essentially allows, as it, as it says, rapid analysis of a DNA sample within an hour. So specifically with regards to human trafficking, where people are trafficked quite quickly through borders in neighboring countries, if they all have access to a rapid DNA system, or instrument, which will allow the quick identification of somebody they suspect of being trafficked. They can then identify or compare that to profiles which sit on a humanitarian DNA database that is held by those different countries, maybe by the United Nations, for instance, a trusted body. And they can quickly identify whether that person who's missing or has been reported missing by their family is in fact the person who they suspect they are. So this kind of technology whilst being used for different purposes in the West, becomes incredibly useful when looking at the major issues we have in Africa and where we specifically need the very uh, rapid identification of other perpetrators or victims um, of various crimes. In June this year, you had a hybrid event in Cape Town. What was that about and how did that go? It was absolutely fantastic. A hybrid event meant that we actually were able to not only stream the presentations to a virtual audience, but at the same time, we had people in the audience, humans, real live people that were able to engage with us. And the energy that that creates really made it more interesting for the virtual viewers, as well as for the people who were in fact in the audience. And in that particular hybrid event, we showcased from the southern region of Africa, the incredible work that's been done um, with forensic DNA profiling, um, whether it was through activists, through survivors, through the actual laboratory itself, um, various other laboratories, um, it, 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 it really worked incredibly well and we had a fantastic response to it and a call for many more. So through that, we are hoping 
to do a similar event in probably East Africa, um, possibly Nairobi next year in the early part of 2022. And the great thing is that through the podcast, through the work that I've done, I have really been able to meet incredible uh, people, innovators, policymakers, um, advocates who will share the platform and speak of their experience in those parts of Africa. So it will become a regional hybrid conf conference that will move from Southern Africa, which we've just had, to East Africa, to West Africa, to North Africa. And in every area, there will always be a link between what's happening in various parts of Africa, but will specifically allow people doing good work in that region to be on a platform and talk and engage with their colleagues and compatriots in finding active-based solutions around the issues that they face. Vanessa, what are your hopes and dreams for DNA for Africa and for forensic DNA awareness and laws? Specifically in Africa, I hope that a lot more administrations come to understand and, and value the incredible power that forensic DNA profiling in conjunction with the DNA database provides in terms of identifying offenders. The number of offenders in every country is, is actually a small minority that continually reoffend. And it's the majority that are actually good and we need to find a way to identify those that are perpetuating violence against the good citizens and allow the shift from the current minority of perpetrators who hold the majority to ransom in terms of the power that they have to change. Because I do believe forensic DNA profiling has the capacity and potential and capabilities of turning that around and creating something that not only deters, but identifies and takes those people out of the system so that more countries can live safely. And there is less of a need for survivors to be speaking their truth um, around gender-based violence and, and crime. Yes, that's my hope.